Hello, everyone. My name is Craig D, Community Health Educator for Indigenous Populations in the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement here at Fred Hutch, and I am Danette Navajo from the Four Corners region of the Navajo Nation. As part of the OCOE's Community Conversations for Community Health Equity video, video series, I am humbled and excited to have a colleague and a friend here for you all, Jenna Bowman. Jenna, it's great to finally have you here. Thank you. Um, I'm Jenna Bowman. Uh, my traditional name is Adzalis, and my colonized name is Jenna Bowman, and I'm an enrolled citizen of the Tulalip Tribes of Washington, and happy to be here with you and have these conversations today. All right. Thank you for being here. Uh, to briefly discuss what cancer health equity means in health services among Indigenous communities. Several of our relatives throughout Indian country continue to face high health disparities across several chronic illnesses such as cancer due to several reasons. And one of those reasons is the continual gaps in health services that many of our communities and relatives fall through in finding adequate care. To our audience, this is a conversation that I have been waiting uh, to share with you because not only is this an important topic for ongoing conversations, but also to have someone here with strong experience in advocating for the health for Indigenous people. And with that said, let's jump right in. So Jenna, uh, as an Indigenous scholar and advocate, what do you see as the main issue of why these gaps exist? They exist, ex exist for many reasons, but from personal and generational experience, um, I'm just gonna share a few things that resonate with me. Um, one of the first things that I know to be true and have experienced through relatives, um, my grandmother being one of them, is the punitive and authoritative relationship that stems from Western healthcare. And part of that is lack of inclusion and respect for traditional healing and health. And that is never considered, it's never considered in policymaking, it's never considered in um, our regimen for care. And it's never honored as evidence-based, even though traditionally we have been healthy people healing ourselves for generations before we were invaded by colonizers. And I think that that's a huge impact on our health and well-being. There's also the fear of that relationship based on the boarding school experiences. You know, as you know, the healthcare system was used to test and used against us as indigenous populations. So when, when an indigenous person goes in, they may nod their head in agreement to what the doctor's saying, but they're not gonna follow through with that care because they don't agree and they're fearful of that relationship or what's gonna be used against them. So they don't argue, they don't dispute, and they probably don't disclose all the information that they need to because there is not a trust relationship built with that healthcare system. Um, I like to talk to our elders and our family members and, and really try to help them understand that they need to have the right people in the room and having the right conversations. And if that means having the matriarch of the family speaking on their behalf to advocate for them in the best way possible, then that's what they need to do. Yeah, that's, thank you for that. And I think you bring up a really good point when it comes to, uh, you know, our, our relatives when they're in the office with the doctor or their provider, you know, they nod their head in agreement and in their mind, they're thinking, you know, this is, this is impossible for me because one, maybe it's due to transportation, two, maybe because of um, additional costs that the healthcare or the, um, that treatment may take. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say like from my grandmother's perspective that I learned a lot from being in the room with her, but one of the things that has really resonated in me engaging in the healthcare system is the opportunity to be a voice and to change. Um, the dominant Western culture's mindset focuses on placing us in boxes. And as an indigenous person, you already know, the circle is essential in the very facet of our all being. There's no beginning, there's no end, we're all connected. And placing us a box in a circle will never work. Um, and from a Western mindset, these boxes are influenced by huge barriers, bias, racism, oppression, and in that mindset, in that Euro Western mindset, their idea is that there's a problem to be fixed and it can only be solved by the dominant culture's expert assistance. And we as indigenous people know that to not be true because we have been caring and healing for ourselves for generations. 
Oh, thanks for bringing that up. And that um, kind of brings us into the next question um, that I want to kind of pull out of, pull something out of you a little bit more. Uh, and it's meant to help our audience understand this large issue. And so could you walk us through uh, an example? I know you provided an example when it kind of came to your, your grandmother, but um, maybe there's another example, or if you want to expand more on that, of what a community member would experience through this complicated system. So as soon as a um, there's a chronic disease or any sort of an ailment that is not fixable or treated by the uh, local tribal clinic, they have to be referred out. And so what are some of the, the gaps in that process? Sure, I'm happy to share. Um, it is very close to home. This is truly what excels my work in the healthcare field. It started with my grandmother, but I am an indig indigenous mother of a child with special needs. She, her being born, born into the Western healthcare system, first of all, I learned rather quickly they're not tolerant of indigenous populations and especially indigenous children that, again, have to be placed in a box and labeled disabled. Um, my daughter was not alive when she was born. She had to be resuscitated. Um, it was due to loss of amniotic fluid, which was unexplained, but I was intensely questioned by the doctor about my background, my history, and how or why I could have lost this amniotic fluid. The doctor requested blood work of me to confirm that even though I had told him I'd never had a history of drug use, he wanted, he wanted actual confirmation. He did blood work to test that there was no drug, drug use. Um, I felt that being identified as an indigenous person put me under a microscope continually from every ounce of the testing to every little thing that was wrong with her. Um, like I said, she wasn't alive, so she was taken away um, right after delivery and I wasn't told right away if she was alive or not. Um, meanwhile, I was being tested by this doctor, questioned. Um, and mind you, she was not my first child, so I, I knew childbearing, I knew my body and I knew that something had happened. Um, unfortunately for the doctor, I was I was ignorant. I, he he wanted to hear nothing of my story, my history, my loss of my father who had died at the time, um, living across country to take care of family who who had cancer. All of which now, as I know in the healthcare system, have an impact on your body and stress levels and can very easily affect the amniotic fluid. Um, hours later, when my daughter was returned, the doctor literally sat in front of me and told me that due to what I had done, my daughter would have repercussions for the rest of her life and only time would tell how extensive they would be. Um, I would have to be continually watched and so would she. Her prognosis was bleak. They said she wouldn't live to be a teenager. They said she would never walk and she would never talk. Um, for me, trying to grasp all of this in a room by myself with a doctor who spoke down to me, who was accusing me of things that I had no control over, it almost, it almost sent me backwards. But in that very moment, I was reminded of the experience my grandmother had gone through, and it almost gave me more power to truly look into what I could do to change this system, to change her ability. And, and I started researching. I started reading. I went back to school. I'm currently working on finishing my PhD. And all of that is so that I can fight a system to change this mindset, to change the bias and the perception that Western culture is the only way. My daughter is 19, she is alive, she is walking, she is talking, and she's graduated from school. None of which would have ever been possible if I had not fought against a system that was set up to destroy me, I feel. And for me, I'm a voice for her, for other people who might be walking in this path behind me, who don't understand this system, who are fearful of this system. And like I said, when this doctor comes in with language that were acronyms and words that were a foreign, foreign, foreign language to me. 
I knew the only way I could change it was by learning the system. I, I honestly, I share my journey and my struggle because together as indigenous people in a Euro Western healthcare system, we honestly face distinct and unique challenges that no other population group faces. Um, indigenous people will continue to experience racial and cultural inequality because the mainstream, mainstream healthcare systems continue to main, maintain privilege and it's influenced by dominance, bias and power. And honestly, I just hope that by sharing my story and other stories and lived experiences, we can change the narrative. Um, we can change the indoctrination of Euro Western culture that has set, defined and controlled this system. And by doing that, we'll be ad addressing racial and cultural health inequality and we will work to decolonize this system. Absolutely, and one of the things that we can definitely do um, to help bridge that gap is to improve the relationships between institutions as well as indigenous communities. Definitely, you know, a place like a research institute or even a healthcare system would need to build uh, or improve their relationships with uh, indigenous people. Well, I think one of the main things that really will build the relationships is um, in the words of Abigail Echohawk, by Indigenous for Indigenous. You know, we know what's best for us. We know what heals us. We know what works for us. I knew that with my daughter. I knew that sending her to an institu institution like they were recommending was never going to be the answer and that I had the answers. She wore a jingle dress and although she couldn't walk and she was in a wheelchair to begin with, the music, the culture, the family, everything that kept her thriving was right in my own upbringing. And I think it starts with us. We have to be inside these systems and it has to be by us, for us. You know, we have to be advocating for ourselves because nobody else can do what we can do. Nobody else can be competent in our culture. Um, because they are not us, they don't live us, they don't understand it. Yes, they can understand and they can have humility when it comes to that, but they cannot have confidence. And humility goes a long ways. You know, they say that at least you're giving your ear to an understanding when you're being humble. And I think that that resonates in every aspect of what we do. Yeah, that's, that's really good, I get. <laughs> to let that one set a little bit for our audience. Uh, and so with our next question, as Indigenous people, we have, again, a, a holistic view of our health. Um, so it's similar to the social determinants of health. Uh, what do you see? Where do you see traditional practices within this Western healthcare system? Well, you know, when you look at social determinants of health, like we can look at economic education, healthcare access, neighborhoods, um, social. Honestly, one thing that we haven't looked at or that has never been included when we have this is the historical trauma and the generational trauma that goes with the historical trauma. So incorporating that into our mindset of social determinants of health is essential to improving the disparities that exist. You know, more than one quarter of indigenous populations are living in poverty. It's a rate that's more than double of the general population from and it started from forced relocation, boarding schools, um, in indigenous child removal. And that continues, that historical and generational trauma, it continues and it impacts everything from our economic stability to access to education because we're in remote and isolated locations and we don't have a true history portrayed about us in, in the educational system. So again, we're stepping into a system that continues to punish us and demoralize us and make us appear as savage to the mainstream system. Um, healthcare access, same thing. If you're only providing us with one service and no specialty care and, and we're in remote and isolated locations, again, you've just created a bigger barrier, you know, and, and we know what will help us. Again, like I said, um, there's just so many things that they all stem from us truly looking at historical and generational trauma and how we change that narrative. Jenna, as always, I'm very grateful for the knowledge and good medicine you shared with me and our audience. 
there was a point where I thought we were in a general meeting and having one of our usual conversations. And it's always a blessing to have you here because not only are you um, reaching out to our audience, you know, I also learned a lot from you just from our conversation today. And I'm appreciative of that and very thankful. And with that said, um, any last words? Sure, I have a few things I just wanna say that um, we as indigenous people truly have the opportunity to use our voices. Um, we have an opportunity to build awareness, create opportunities to educate stakeholders and decision makers. That includes the true history of our people, um, which also again impacts social determinants of health. Um, we have the opportunity to help promote policies that include and advance tribal, public and environmental health. And we have the opportunity to integrate our tribal voices into all aspects of health. Um, for me, like I said, my call to action is it's time. It's, and indigenous people have been uncomfortable for way too long. It's time for the entire population to be uncomfortable and to have honest, open conversations. It's time to use our voices and it's time to be heard. We all need to just remind ourselves of our shared goals and what we can do to improve and change the conversation around racial equity and inclusion. Um, and my call to action, honestly, is honor your culture and traditions, practice them, acknowledge historical trauma, and respect tribal perspectives. Jenna, well, thank you for sharing that. And I, I think I remember you saying something that you wanted to share uh, a little something from our youth. Um, did you want to go ahead and share that? Sure. I have a 17 year old child who listens daily to my conversations around changing the narrative. And my 17 year old wrote this and I'm gonna read it verbatim because it's a poem that she had to write on changing the narrative and using her voice. So three crops ago, I was a barbarian to the land I owned. My native language stolen from my tongue. The land hardened under my feet, the sky clouded with bricks and stone. My braids undone from my crown are quilt rotting as it lies in a trunk. As I lengthen in years, my native tongue is absent. My heirs knowing not of our once bare land. Traditional attire used scarcely for dances as our sacred land becomes lean. Conditioned to speak like the colonists. Now my grandchildren are absent of the beauty of our culture. Attracted to the addictions that the white man has brought us. The women of my tribe lost and disregarded. As my culture is skewed by the white man's eyes, we have become the people of costume. As the third crop, I am conditioned to please the white man, my crown never to wear my rightful braids. The language, a lost link in my mind. Three crops ago, I was not labeled a native, I was human. Thanks for sharing that, Jenna. That, that was really impactful. And I think that also really encourages this you know this forum or this video series to also include more voices from our from our youth and yeah thank you for your time today jenna thank you to our viewer audience and so with that said thank you for tuning in today and remember to stay safe and stay healthy